The World We Create From God to Market by Thomas Bjorkman, read by Mark Meadows. The first decade of the 20th century is a time of great enthusiasm in anticipation of scientific breakthroughs, new technology, and growing prosperity from the global market. However, it is an enthusiasm coupled with wonder and horror at modernity's peculiar duality. Great dangers and dreamlike possibilities interspersed within a hodgepodge of everyday boredom, science fiction and totalitarian utopian promises. The new industrial society provides hope of a better future, but it also creates alienation, confusion and the erosion of old traditions. On the one hand, we stand before fantastic future opportunities. On the other, the abyss lurks menacingly at every corner. The twentieth century might go either way, it appears. It is also a time of accelerating globalization propelled by growing world trade. Never before have so many parts of the world been so interconnected. Simultaneously, we also experience rampant nationalism and rising global injustices. There are great migration flows, with millions of poor crossing half the globe in search of a better life. Some are winners in this age's globalization, many are losers. This includes individuals as well as entire nations. Like today, the early 20th century is also characterized by new global power dislocations. We go from a world where the British Empire dominates the global market and the seven seas to an unstable, multipolar geopolitical situation with new burgeoning economies such as the United States, Germany, Japan and Russia. Old empires are in a state of decay, while new challenges are waiting and ready to replace them. The beginning of the 20th century is a time when modernity and the rational thought perspective stand before their final breakthrough and victory parade across the world, causing old conventions, social relations and previously robust symbol worlds to undergo thorough revision. Old worlds are in decay, and as so often before in history, a transition to the new is no smooth process. Conceptions of yesteryear no longer suffice, which gives rise to new revolutionary thoughts, philosophical currents and artistic expressions. But it is also a time characterised by chauvinism, racism and the elite's stubborn defence of old privileges. These conditions throw the world into chaos and turmoil, from which it is not possible to predict what will emerge next. The sinking of the Titanic in 1912 represented a serious blow to humanity's faith in technological progress. After all, she was, according to engineering science, believed to be unsinkable. The next blow, however, proves to have far more sinister consequences. The outbreak of war in 1914 comes as a dark surprise for the many observers who had argued that technology and nations' mutual relations of interdependence in the new global age made great wars obsolete. With the First World War, we realise that modernization is not just a one-sided success story. The world discovers that Western civilization may not be so civilised after all. We learn that our heralded progress is able to bring about devastation as well as blessings, and that increased global trade is no guarantee against catastrophic wars. The very same science and technologies to improve our living standards are also capable of creating new, deadly, efficient killing machines such as machine guns, tanks and mustard gas. The war that started as a strategic move to establish a new balance of power between the leading European nations was meant to be very brief, but instead it becomes a protracted slaughter that will last for four long years. Millions of young men annihilate each other with industrial, state-of-the-art weapons. The war affects entire populations. Millions of spouses, fathers and sons never come back from the trenches. Many of those who survive return with mutilated bodies, and most of them with scars on their souls that never heal. A generation of Europe's youth is sacrificed 
and entire societies remain in collective shock for decades to come. What should have been a golden and glorious future with undreamed of opportunities for humanity is transformed in the bloody mud of the trenches into disappointment, broken spirits, and a fight for survival after the war. There is a shortage of all kinds of goods, occasional starvation, and in Germany even hyperinflation. The previously so promising international labour movement has to admit its failure. The workers of the world proved more willing to kill each other for king and country than to fight capitalism in solidarity with international socialism. In Russia, however, there is a revolution, but Soviet communism remains a national phenomenon. The internationalization of the world that was well on its way before the war has to give way to a situation where the nations of the world once again become more insular. The global world that took generations to build collapses in the war, and it will take two generations and yet another bloody world war to reach the same level of international trade again. The interwar period is marked by growing protectionism and nationalism that eventually result in another catastrophe. The Western world, marked by war, now starts to lose some of its optimism about the future. From having embraced science and technology as the path to a better future, we are now compelled to question science as a project merely for the good. Science has expressed itself in unexpected and unfortunate ways. After all, it did not prove a particularly reliable instrument for giving the world a firm moral footing. Doubt and confusion are prevalent among intellectuals and common people alike. We become more disillusioned, expressed, for instance, in the decadence of the 1920s and the art and literature of this decade. But it is also a time of innovative artistic expression and new philosophical insights. The moral vacuum in the wake of the old symbolic world's lost legitimacy following the war provides a new basis from which intellectuals criticise the status quo and offer new ways of looking at existence. Science, technology and the prevailing social order are critically scrutinised and reason and the rationalist thought perspective are questioned as the only valid precepts. The 1930s become a decade of extreme poverty for large parts of the population in both Europe and North America. Hitler wins the election in Germany in 1933 with promises of a better future, and in the United States the economy is reformed under Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal during the same decade. Both create economic growth, but Nazism's model leads to catastrophe. In the Soviet Union, Stalin manages to industrialise a poor agrarian society, turning it into a modern great power and a viable competitor to the capitalist model. During the same period, social democratic movements make headway in the Nordic countries, a development that in many ways resembles the reforms in the United States, but goes somewhat further, offering a compromise between unregulated capitalism and authoritarian communism. The catastrophe that was not allowed to occur happens anyway when Hitler's expanding Germany invades Poland in 1939. With the Second World War, the next blow is dealt to an already shaky world. In the new war, science contributes with even more efficient weapons of destruction. It is an even worse industrial slaughter than the first, and people are being murdered with scientific precision and industrial efficiency in concentration camps, terror bombings, and finally, with atomic bombs. The war serves as yet another trauma to trigger a collective state of shock, a disappointment in the world, humanity, and progress. The remaining faith that reason and science will guarantee constant and unambiguous progress definitively dies with the catastrophe of the Second World War. At the same time, humanity starts to develop an increasingly complex view in terms of self-comprehension. As early as the beginning of the 20th century, the psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud publishes his groundbreaking insights into human psychology. Freud argues that we are largely governed by unconscious desires, not at all the rational creatures the Enlightenment philosophers previously assumed. He claims that we do not have control of ourselves 
and that our motives are often shrouded in obscurity even to ourselves. Naturally, Freud's theories spark protests, just as Copernicus's and Darwin's had done before. Our self-image is dealt a further blow. It is no longer sufficient to admit that we are merely animals developed by chance on the outskirts of the universe. Now we are forced to realise that we are not even aware of the inner mental processes that govern us. We are controlled by murky forces that we can only with great efforts of self-examination become aware of. The horrors of war, which human reason created, or at least had not been able to prevent, also contribute to our altered self-image. A new critical spirit settles after the war. This will in time lead to a completely new thought perspective that still, to this date, strives to replace the outmoded rational thought perspective. With the burgeoning market economy, our appetite for consumer goods grows accordingly. For lack of meaningful contexts, stability, shared values and optimism about the future, consumption becomes ever more important. Religion can no longer keep market forces at bay. The common values and moral order that religion used to cultivate are diluted. Old virtues such as self-restraint, moderation and thrift are no longer cherished. Instead, self-indulgence, pleasure and limitless consumerism are given free reign. New technologies once again change our existence, but now to a degree that even benefits ordinary people. Conveniences in the home, such as household appliances, improve our daily existence and radio, television and air travel interconnect the world even further. Now the vast majority of the population lives in cities and consists primarily of salaried workers within specialised professions in industry and service. In the new consumer society, with its ever-expanding division of labour and specialisation, we produce fewer kinds of services and goods ourselves and start to request things on the market that were previously taken care of within the family. This creates new jobs in, for example, the food industry, child and elderly care, and the ready-made garment industry. Entertainment is also managed by specialists to a higher degree than before, e.g. through cinemas, radio and television. Moreover, life also becomes increasingly complex, necessitating completely new specialised services from professionals such as car mechanics, electricians and plumbers. What is new is that progress doesn't just benefit a small elite, but the whole population, especially in the democratic capitalist West. Thereby, democracy, capitalism and consumer society prove to be an efficient meme combination, one to outcompete all other social systems. However, despite its apparent success, this societal model would not remain unchallenged. In the Western consumer societies during the 1960s, there appears a growing criticism of the downsides of modernity and a questioning of social conventions. Even science as the highest authority on truth is put into question. A new generation rebels against their parents who could not prevent the horrors of the Second World War and whose archaic values, chauvinism and blindness to the dangers of modernity are held responsible for the very existence of life on Earth being threatened by total nuclear annihilation. At the same time, we are dealing with the most privileged generation ever. For the first time, a majority of the population in the West grows up in relative affluence, with good educational opportunities and without having to worry about food. Maybe it is not so strange that parents find it so hard to understand their children at this time, but it is precisely because of such great wealth that it is now possible for young people to create an identity of their own, question the social order and thus approach a more critical and complex conception of reality. Social reality and our culture, our collective imaginary, become ever more fluid and without a fixed centre. We have a number of alternative subjective realities to choose from. This is expressed in new movements and new religions. Drugs are used recreationally and change the perception of the world in the hippie culture of the 1960s. 
Rock and roll breaks on through to the other side with a new culture and a message of peace and love. Gentler values and emotions are embraced, as well as a rebellious freedom from a society that is perceived as repressive and obsolete. In the Parisian student revolt of 1968, there is a belief in change and a better world for all. The new dreams are now based on theories from psychology, sociology and Marxism, which are used to rebel against the old society. The world has changed so much from the conditions that brought consumer society into existence, and a growing part of the population feel the need for a new societal order. The awareness of the world and the human being's role in it also increases. Reactions against the environmental degradation of industrial society also start to occur in the 1960s, even though it will take a couple more decades before we reach a more general environmental awareness. Yet, at the start of the 1960s, a seed is sown for today's environmental movements through Rachel Carson's landmark book, Silent Spring. This is one of the earliest harbingers of the flip side of industrialization in terms of environmental degradation and unsustainable depletion of finite resources. It will be followed in 1972 by the report of the Club of Rome, Limits to Growth, which for the first time expresses the environmental challenges in scientific numbers. The development that has recovered after the world wars and seemed so promising now appears even more precarious, questioned as it is ever more frequently and radically. During this period, we also see the communist countries conduct an optimistic but naive attempt to make the rational ordering of society work once and for all. In the end, the communist system becomes highly unsustainable. Insights about the socialist state's problems become more apparent during the post-war period. The art of social engineering is increasingly questioned, and the intellectuals in the West, who have previously been Marxists, lose faith in grandiose collectivist solutions and in socialism as a political project, and are henceforth thrown into ideological crisis. Their visions are fragmented even further through the humanitarian catastrophe of the Cultural Revolution in China, the oppression of basic human rights in communist societies, and the Eastern Bloc's tangible economic difficulties. When the wall finally comes down, the failure of state socialism is already abundantly clear. The fundamental problem of communism is that it needs considerable measures of oppression in order to work. Oppression of the human being's free will to act in accordance with market forces, as well as oppression of its will to choose a non-communist government. A large part of the communist society's resources is thereby wasted on coercive control measures to ensure the system's continuity, as well as the military ability to keep capitalist societies at bay. Even if relatively few people in the West saw the state socialist countries as paragons, it nevertheless entailed the presence of two clear political balancing forces in the world. Now, however, the market has finally triumphed and the socialist ideal has lost. As such, there are no longer any living ideals to pit against the market and financial profit. The market can thereby spread without any notable challenges. No longer does the fear of revolution restrain the forces of the market from taking over completely, since no viable alternative exists to legitimise a revolutionary movement. When there no longer exists a strong collectivist ideal in society, the market becomes the source of people's hopes. Neoliberalism, which is built on liberal ideas of freedom from the 17th and 18th centuries, becomes a powerful political ideology during the last few decades of the 20th century. This ideological current transforms politics with its economic ideology of neoliberalism, the unapologetic defence of capitalism and the individual's extended rights and freedom from the state. Rights can comprise anything from various degrees of individual ownership to the possession of weapons, depending on nation and political proponents. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan 
are iconic examples of state leaders who advocate the neoliberal view of individual rights and a so-called night watchman state during this period. The failure of the collectivist ideal of communism gives rise to a greater emphasis on the individual, to a degree even where it challenges the very notion of there being any collective at all, as Margaret Thatcher famously put it, who is society, there is no such thing. Without a collective ideal to shape our further development of society and the declining faith in the state and in politics, the individual and its self-interest are, in somewhat simplified terms, all that remain. In addition, the steady and widespread criticism of all social conventions, moralities and notions of what is better and truer that prevails in late capitalist society leaves us without a solid compass to guide our efforts towards a better society. What is better or truer is now up to the individual and its personal opinions. No more shall any authorities tell us what is good, right or true. The void that appears is thereby taken over by the idea of the individual's personal freedom and, without any commonly shared ideas to determine where to go collectively, we thus allow the market to decide for us. Now begins the era of privatisation. The sale of state-owned companies, public institutions, schools and healthcare facilities is carried out at a brisk pace without a thorough impact assessment. Few actually investigate which public institutions benefit from being privatised and which remain inherently unfit to function on market terms. We forget that there are values that cannot be measured in money and that there are institutions that fulfil socially important functions that cannot be left to the caprices of paying customers and profitability. Without any academic understanding of the market outside the dominating neoliberal paradigm, it becomes difficult to criticise and manage it. The market subsumes ever greater parts of society and encounters very little resistance. The system crashes repeatedly. This is not because the market is as such a bad idea or because of greedy individuals. It is rather the result of an unregulated or, more precisely, incorrectly regulated market. The fundamental flaw of liberalism is its unequivocal focus on the individual at the cost of the society. What is good for the individual in the short term is often at odds with what is best for the greater whole. Overconsumption of cheap goods produced under dubious working conditions in poor countries may benefit the individual who buys them here and now, but in the long term it puts the well-being of society at risk and eventually the life of the individual when environmental degradation and poverty-derived conflicts cause disruptions that intrude into our personal lives. We all benefit from the well-being of others, since it reduces the risk they will behave in hostile ways towards us and increases the chance they will develop in ways that allow for productive and mutually beneficial cooperation with ourselves later on. Many things benefit us in our daily lives that can only be achieved through collective efforts. Not everything can be obtained by free choice on the market, if we want good roads, secure neighbourhoods and functioning legal institutions, it is necessary that we collectively make binding obligations to ensure we all contribute the necessary resources to support such measures. It cannot depend on free choice. Collective goods simply do not function very well on the market. Paying for roads, cops and laws every time we need them is not very practical. But there are also other services, such as schools, hospitals and cultural institutions, that in practical terms can function on market terms, but arguably are better managed collectively, if for no other reason than it ensures that everyone can obtain access to these even if they cannot pay. We all benefit from living in societies with educated, healthy people within a well-functioning collective imaginary. For societies to be efficient and meaningful, it is required that they are based on binding obligations, collectively deliberated conventions about what is expected from the individual and what the obligations of the collective towards the individual are. 
This is obvious if we want to retain the rule of law and avoid regressing to an anarchy of all against all. However, if we reduce our only overarching collective structure to its most minimal functions of keeping people from physically harming one another and ensuring respect for each other's property, then we simultaneously remove all the meaning and identity-creating fuel of the collective imaginary that keeps it together in the first place. If society is viewed as nothing more than a physical place that facilitates our production and consumption patterns, and if the role of most other people is only to serve our material needs, with our primary relation to others limited to the exchange of services and products by monetary means, it may very well cease to be a society. Not only do we risk society falling apart, as it makes us more inclined towards questioning what we actually need each other for, in case we do not gain any utility from those relations, we also risk our lives becoming emotionally impoverished. While the market takes over and we lose faith in both God, science and other ideals, there is simultaneously a development of what we might call structural doubt and organised disappointment, amounting to an entirely new thought perspective that can be termed postmodernism. The post prefix indicates that it is the next overarching thought structure and societal current to come after modernity. But it also carries an explicit critique of modern society and thinking and an implicit claim of being a replacement of modernity. As such, Postmodernity is an emergent phenomenon in our symbol world akin to the religious and rational thought perspectives before it. So here, for the first time since the Enlightenment, we now have a credible contestant to dethrone the dominant mode of thought once again. Doubts about the Enlightenment project, reason and science grow ever stronger during the 20th century, but most of society, to this date, clings on to rationality and the modern project. In the 1970s and 80s, a new postmodern thought perspective makes its way into academia, primarily the humanities. Enter chic rebels like Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault and Judith Butler. Exit old bigwigs like Auguste Comte and Herbert Spencer. Good old Marx is kept in high esteem, but among the leading Western thinkers, his ideas are developed beyond the structural limitations of traditional Marxism and take on more post-structural forms by stressing epistemological and psychological aspects to a higher degree. It is from this development in academia during the post-war period that we have the term postmodernism itself, but its intellectual heritage can be traced further back in time to great thinkers such as Wittgenstein and Heidegger in the first half of the 20th century, and arguably even all the way back to Nietzsche in the late 19th century. Postmodernism is, however, not a coherent, uniform and institutionalised school of thought with fixed authorities and commonly agreed-upon methodologies and research projects. It is more of an umbrella term to designate a number of thinkers and thought traditions which may or may not self-identify as postmodern. It is also used to describe certain societal developments, of which some are influenced by postmodern thoughts, but also developments that are merely characteristic of capitalist consumer society. Postmodernism is, first of all, a reaction against the perceived superficial, intellectually inadequate and soulless rationality of modernity and the many injustices modern society brings about, despite its promises. Initially, modernity and its cult of rationality were criticised for not sufficiently capturing the manifold beauty of human life and for not providing meaningful spiritual experiences. This is where we meet the romantics of the 19th century, as mentioned in the last chapter. Only later is modernity criticised for not fostering social justice and equality, and its pursuit of knowledge and progress claims to be self-illusory and shallow. According to these critics, the modern approach has been one-dimensional and failed in its task of enlightenment and emancipation. As an alternative... A wide range of alternative perspectives are offered in science, art and philosophy. This is where we find feminism, post-colonialism, environmentalism and even New Age spiritualism.
Jean-François Lyotard wrote in 1979 that, simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern as incredulity towards meta-narratives. By meta-narratives, he meant the teleological stories that guide or structure our explanations of reality, the overarching, commonly shared symbol worlds that keep our collective imaginaries together in large, coherent weaves, or myths, in another word. The ferocious killing of all mythologies that began with rationalism thereby continues with postmodernity, but now including a death sentence for myths such as the nation, scientific objectivity, and even gender roles. In light of the rampant ecological destruction caused by industrial society and the unequal distribution of its spoils, the modern idea of progress is likewise criticised and exposed to be just another harmful myth. But the foremost myths to have been brought to the slaughter are perhaps those from which power and authority are derived. The capitalist society we live in today is very different from the one described by Marx in the 19th century. It still runs on the productive engine of industrial capitalism, but there are critical differences that are getting increasingly obvious at the beginning of the 21st century. With the Internet becoming an integral part of ever more aspects of existence, things are starting to change in ways that may reveal the contours of a very different society emerging. Information technologies, AI and robotics have progressed to a level where more and more jobs are getting automated. The most developed and affluent economies are no longer characterised by their industrial output, but rather by their ability to generate new innovations in the symbol world. This entails scientific advances on the one hand, and on the other, cultural accomplishments, for instance in the form of entertainment products such as movies, music and computer games. Such commodities are sold on the world market at very favourable exchange rates and provide the nations who possess these productive capabilities a most advantageous position on the global stage. A Korean politician once noticed that the value of the movie Jurassic Park was equal to about one and a half million Hyundai cars. And with significantly fewer working hours associated with the former, the production of high-end entertainment commodities accordingly constitutes a valuable asset to the nations that produce them. The most powerful industries today are not the steel mills and automobile manufacturers, but those preoccupied with developing the latest in bits and bytes, and those who control the billions of virtual dollars that make the world economy go round. This does not mean that the physical products themselves are without importance, but physical reality has been subordinated to the logic of the symbolic. In the hierarchies of value, the contents of products are mostly below that of the brands themselves, and the ones who most skillfully excel in the art of advertising will win the most profitable shares of the market. In our day and age, symbols, not manufactured goods, have thus moved to the centre of the economy, whereby the growing emphasis on innovation and knowledge has given rise to a new privileged class of creatives and made those who master the symbols most competently the new rulers of the world. At the same time, globalisation has pushed the production of industrial goods to the margins of the world economy, leaving a growing precariat behind in the old industrial heartlands of the West. In the most developed economies, it is no longer the working class that is the most marginalised group in society. In fact, the industrial workers have largely disappeared, and instead we see a growing number of people outside the labour market who live off government handouts and occasional odd jobs. Starvation or other poverty-inflicted threats to existence are no longer a major concern in the leading capitalist societies. Today, it is rather a lack of meaning and motivation, as proposed by Jürgen Habermas, and the alienation of living a life without any higher purpose that is the root of much suffering, and, simultaneously, one of the greatest threats to the stability of society. The old class structure of industrial society seems to have given way to a new kind of social division and the issues revolving around class conflicts have changed as well. 
Inequalities have risen dramatically in the last 30 years, but the political divisions in late modern societies seem to have less to do with income differences as it has with more cultural and value-centred ones. This has become evident by new voting patterns, most notably with how traditional working-class people have begun to support more conservatively inclined nationalist movements. Many of those who are far better off and, in Marxist terms, belong to the bourgeoisie, seem more inclined towards applauding postmodern values that emphasise equality, individual rights and environmental protection. In late capitalist society, political division thus seems to revolve more around the clash between symbol worlds and meaning-making than economic differences. On one side, we have the highly privileged class of creative professionals, ethnic and sexual minorities, and a growing group of young, progressively inclined urban people who hover between the new precariat and a foothold in the creative industries, and on the other, we have the traditional working-class religious people of varying income groups and the older power holders of wealth and privilege. This is arguably a very different society from that described by Marx. How we see the world ultimately decides how we shape it, and the ones who master the symbols most competently and manage to gain the attention of people accordingly get to choose how the world is seen and what is to be done with it. All of this has led to a version of modernity, a postmodern kind, where physical reality has become more subordinated to the logic of symbols and narratives. What is imagined as real has less to do with how the world appears to our senses and more with how it is conveyed to us through the symbols in the media. The new conditions in our media-saturated reality have, despite society's capitalist foundation, begun to take on characteristics that can be described as highly postmodern. We are no longer as well informed about the conditions and events in our nearby physical surroundings. The lives of our neighbours often remain largely unknown to us, but we tend to be up to date with even the most intimate details of celebrities we do not know in person. This has led to a very postmodern condition, where our minds are filled with images of strangers that we feel we have a personal relation with, but are only acquainted with through the symbol world. These people tend to be highly successful individuals, famous movie stars, powerful politicians or accomplished scientists and intellectuals. So when we reflect upon our social world, ponder our own role in it and inevitably start to compare ourselves with all of these people in our mind, we may feel a little inadequate. Not as beautiful as all the happy people in the magazines, maybe a little fat, and far from as successful as all these smart and wealthy people who enter the headlines. We may even gain a growing sense of inferiority towards our friends on Facebook, who constantly put up pictures of their happy and interesting lives. This may lead us to participate in the ongoing arms race of presenting our lives as perfect and meaningful on social media. After all, what matters the most in this postmodern condition is how reality is portrayed in the world of the symbolic, not how it really is. Postmodernism is inherently hostile towards capitalism and modern consumer society, but plain and simple anti-capitalism is, however, not a sufficiently new phenomenon to differentiate it from the rational thought perspective. Modern thinkers, such as socialists and anarchists, have since the beginnings of capitalism criticised its exploitative nature and unequal distribution of wealth. This is part of the postmodern criticism of capitalism, but in addition, it claims that capitalism reinforces traditional gender roles and racism, destroys the environment, and focuses too narrowly on material growth rather than psychological well-being and personal self-expression. However, Nowhere in the world do we see a fundamentally different societal model to the capitalist one take form. The high ideals of equality, spiritual communion and environmental sustainability advocated by postmodern thinkers and activists remain far from realisation in even the most progressive societies today. Yet postmodern thought and new societal developments have changed the game to some extent. 
First of all, many of the most developed economies have become so affluent and offer their citizens such a degree of material security that they have made ever more people adhere to so-called post-materialist values. This does not mean that people have become ascetics or that they are against material acquisitions as such. On the contrary, the high material living standards have simply made them more concerned with other aspects of life than acquiring more possessions. When a growing number of people rarely have to worry about their basic needs, the share of individuals who spend more of their time on non-monetary relations accordingly goes up, evident by the activities of many middle-class people in affluent countries. Here we see an increased number of people engaged in voluntary work, activism, hobbies and artistic expressions, and even new spiritual communities. When a certain level of material wealth has been reached, people on average simply prefer to do other things than making money. Many of these highly privileged people also tend to favour equality, environmental sustainability and personal and artistic expression over economic growth. In short, postmodern values, partly because they are privileged enough to do so. With the Internet, Postmodern thought spreads like never before, and those who feel oppressed, alienated or exploited by modern society are only a click away from obtaining the intellectual and spiritual ammunition that addresses their situation and makes them feel empowered or even entitled. The viral, fast-paced dynamic of social media can create massive exposure to a previously neglected issue so that it can no longer be ignored. The Internet has truly changed how public discourse is formed, and it seems to favour the social, cultural and political agendas derived from postmodern critical thought. However, there is something that postmodernity has not managed to address efficiently and appears completely incapable of alleviating. One of the greatest unresolved issues in our increasingly postmodern and culturally fractured age is the lack of a new commonly shared symbol world, a new meta-narrative in other words. Grand collective visions that can unite the majority of the population are a scarce resource today. Thus far, postmodernism has not created a new collective narrative powerful enough to curb the relentless spread of the market which the postmodernists partly, and rather unintentionally, have helped to unleash by refusing to propose an overarching alternative narrative. Postmodernity is inherently hostile towards all authorities and power structures and has as its central objective to reveal all the injustice, oppression and arbitrary narratives on which they rely. And with many of the societal developments of late modern society, especially that of the Internet, it has now acquired the means to challenge those power structures. The aforementioned philosopher Lyotard once wrote that postmodernism is the consequence of capital and informational flows that have moved beyond political or instrumental control. This is precisely what has happened with the emergence of the Internet, where larger amounts of information and capital circulate beyond governmental control, though not completely, but still to an extent unparalleled in history. Recently, the Internet has even given rise to its own monetary currencies, blockchain technologies like Bitcoin, which are likely to erode the state's political control of capital even further in the future. Another circumstance to have deprived political power holders of their control on capital and information, and if we agree with Lyotard, is a postmodern development, is the fact that the market has grown explosively in size and importance in the wake of the last decades of globalization and thus become impossible for any state to control or even regulate in an appropriate manner. The growing wealth this development has brought about has also made many regular citizens so affluent that it has helped them escape some of the instrumental controls that would previously have limited their freedom of action. The authorities do not have the same sway over people's lives as they used to. Citizens of late modern societies are often wealthy enough have the sufficient educational level and adequate access to informational technologies so as to defy the centres of political and economic control. Even people of modest means are increasingly capable of defying those who try to control them. 
since the overproduction of industrial society makes it relatively easy to have one's basic material needs met, it accordingly makes people less inclined towards doing what they are told, as they are more likely to survive if they don't. So, just like the economic development of agrarian society and the emergence of new information technologies during the Axial Age allowed for challenges to arise at the margins of the centres of power, so do similar developments in late modernity generate opponents to counter the accumulation of power and wealth, the oppression and injustices, and the dated narratives of modern society today. In simple terms, Writing was to the Axial Age what the Internet is to the postmodern age. And just like the Axial traditions, postmodernity likewise seeks to redistribute wealth and power in accordance with new moral standards and to alter the rules of the game in which power relations play out. Postmodernity has many similarities with the movements of the Axial Age. Postmodernism also has its righteous rebels and affiliated churches such as feminism, post-colonialism and environmentalism. These rebels can be said to constitute a new priesthood, also known as the rather postmodern invention of the intellectual, whose mission it is to discipline and correct those unfortunate enough to gravitate towards lower thought perspectives, much like the way in which priests, mullahs and other religious figures have tried to instil good moral behaviour to conform with the religious thought perspective. The more altruistic reasoning of postmodern arguments on ethics are simply conceptually superior. Quantitative, by a more expansive circle of solidarity that includes all humans and often even animals, and qualitative, by considering more sensitive and delicate matters. As such, many people at least want to pretend they subscribe to postmodern values. After all, no one wants to be a racist or a sexist and who wants to argue against the fact that the environment is important? But in reality, many in late modern society are merely paying lip service to the ethical code of postmodernity. When postmodernists have finished picking apart common people's chauvinist and narrow minded arguments, the latter usually remain just as suspicious to their strange looking ethnic neighbours, don't really care about gender equality and continue consuming without any regards to the environmental consequences. The widespread conduct of postmodernists to intellectually strong-arm their opponents and humiliate them if they don't has not been without its consequences. Postmodern thought has alienated a large number of people and caused a fair amount of resentment and bitterness. In later years, there has arisen a growing criticism of the oppression of the so-called social justice warriors, the politically correct elite and the cultural Marxists, partly facilitated by the same Internet technologies that have greatly assisted postmodernity to enter the mainstream. In recent years, it has even become increasingly harder for postmodernists to efficiently counter these critics, who have learned to master the postmodern ways of dominating media discourse. The problem is that postmodernism does not resonate with the emotions, understanding of reality, meaning-making and lifestyles of people who gravitate towards other thought perspectives. To the average modern person, the discourses postmodernists talk about are simply not visible, and the structures considered oppressive by postmodernism are often seen as hard but well-deserved rights and natural facts of life that cannot be changed. Similarly, when postmodernists pick apart sacred scriptures and point out the contradictions of religious faiths, religious people rarely feel they are done a favour as the beauty and deep-felt meaning they get from these are severely jeopardised, all while no alternative to be grasped and appreciated is offered in return. Another related problem is postmodernism's lack of any grand narratives to be shared by people subscribing to different thought perspectives. Postmodernists simply do not realise or want to accept that people vary greatly in their thought patterns and meaning-making and that it can be very difficult to understand and value postmodern ideas if one is not sufficiently adjusted to these on an emotional and cognitive level. Instead, they tend to stubbornly insist on emphasising the analytic aspects that appear so painstakingly obvious to them 
using their cultural and intellectual superiority to force-feed people arguments that are perceived as utterly alien and counterintuitive by those unversed in postmodern linguistic analyses. Apparently, the postmodern thought perspective carries no method to include the perspectives of other thought perspectives, convey its insights in ways that make sense to all kinds of people, or to make differently thinking people perceive the postmodernists as friends and allies rather than adversaries. Despite the postmodern emphasis on inclusion and diversity, this thought perspective has yet to find efficient and emotionally sensitive measures to facilitate the peaceful cooperation of modern society's many different people towards a common goal. This has alienated a fair share of modern people to the postmodern thought perspective to a degree where many, in defiance of the postmodern discourse they feel is oppressing them, have reacted in ways more similar to pre-modern thought and behaviour. Anger and bitterness, it seems, tend to have this effect on people. As a consequence, we see otherwise supposedly democratic and rational people turn towards bigotry, authoritarianism and jingoism. Recent political developments in Europe and North America may be an indication of this, and since postmodernism has failed to offer any alternatives with sufficiently inclusive power to counter this development, it has thus started to lose some of its previously won legitimacy in society at large. Without any adequately convincing narratives to address the emotional and psychological needs of people, which arguably are responsible for many of the latest political developments in the West, some aspects of society seem to have regressed to lower levels of development, especially in regards to ethics. This partly has to do with postmodernism's ambivalent approach to ethics. Postmodernists are generally highly concerned with ethical issues, perhaps more than anything else, but the seemingly inherent moral relativism of postmodernism appears to obstruct the possibility of a new moral system being developed. This is further inhibited by postmodern hostility towards all grand narratives. As a result, the postmodern era has become characterized by growing fragmentation, a branching of different symbol worlds, subcultures, and identities, with a declining connection to the overall symbol world of society. One unintended consequence of excessive focus on identity politics has been that no one is allowed to voice the concern of the greater we of society. If a new moral system is to be commonly shared by the majority, it requires a shared symbol world that resonates with people on different stages of thought, identities and cultural backgrounds, one where they feel comfortable and are provided with a sense of communion with the larger society they live in. This has not occurred. As such, postmodernism has not managed to outcompete and replace the current market-driven order. In a world where people have increasing difficulties relating to each other, divided by misdirected identity politics, find little in common with people who think differently and thus lack a sense of shared identity within larger society, relations can erode. Consequently, the only thing that connects us in the end, the only efficient means to manage our productive day-to-day -day relations with each other, is the rather emotionally unsatisfactory and culturally impoverished measure of money. The circumstance that postmodern thought lacks a credible alternative to market-driven capitalist society has become more obvious since the end of the Cold War. Lost are the initial optimism and beliefs in a better society to combine democracy, social justice and spiritual growth that characterised the younger generations of the 1960s and 70s. Still, many of these early postmodern movements' values have successfully been adopted by mainstream society. Social customs and interactions have become less stiff and formal. Old moral conventions regarding sexuality have been abandoned and it has become acceptable for young people to choose their own path in life. However, these values are entirely compatible with modern capitalist society. In fact, they have actually been fully appropriated by market forces and no longer appear as the revolutionary threats they used to. This can be explained by the fact that the values of the counterculture that were most successfully implemented in society 
with the exact ones that, under closer scrutiny, are more modern than postmodern, the freedoms of expression, individual life choices, and the hedonistic indulgence in sex, drugs, and new consumer-friendly music tastes like rock and roll, are all inherently modern reactions against the last crumbling remains of the religious thought perspective. Alienated youngsters with postmodern hippie sentiments of peace and love, and the French philosophers who set out to deconstruct all the mythological discourses of modern society may have helped this development take place, but the end result was a society more modern than ever. Following the height of the counterculture movement, consumerism reached new levels of individual indulgence and ecological destruction, the market expanded greatly and took over ever more aspects of society, and the new sexual freedom became just another wrapping for commodities and a means to sell us new things to make us feel sexy and desirable, all to the tones of seductive popular music to satisfy growing consumer demand. The postmodern ideas of gender equality mostly progressed to a level where women were given the same formal rights as men and given a position on the labour market. So very modern. But highly male chauvinist values remained and are only waning very slowly. Women have never reached the same level of pay as men and blatant double standards regarding women's sexuality remain present and widespread, the concern with environmental issues likewise only increased very slowly. However, the greatest disappointment with postmodernity's first major development on the societal level was its complete failure to replace the modern capitalist consumer society and its market-driven ethos with a credible alternative. This became perfectly evident after the end of the Cold War, when the last remaining post-structuralist Marxists either gave up died or hid themselves in obscure university departments far, far away. The flower children have long grown up, cut their long hair, and long been way too preoccupied with tending their lives as common consumers and wage earners, raising families of their own, too busy to fight the power. Consequently, much of postmodernity has become increasingly prone to sarcasm and cynicism, merely mocking its opponents but rarely proposing any alternatives to the current order. The early postmodern hippie movement, naively but sincerely preaching peace and love and dreaming about a gentler and more spiritually enlightened society, has thus been replaced by today's dominant postmodern currents, the satirical and deeply sarcastic comedians, the cynical intellectuals and a new upper class of creatives using postmodern lingo and art expressions to bolster their politically correct images and to proudly flash their higher levels of cultural capital. As the initial surge of postmodern developments has come to an end and it has become clear that the system is not going to be changed, many of those who have been lucky enough to successfully transition to the new thought perspective are now using their newly gained privilege of cultural, intellectual and ethical superiority to position themselves favourably within the current system. The Marxist-inspired postmodern intellectuals have gradually put their dreams of revolution on hold, given up on any new overarching narratives to support a new societal model and thereby become truly postmodern in Lyotard's understanding and begun to engage in different minor narratives instead, such as various minority issues, identity projects, and other more particularistic social critiques. Unlike their Marxist predecessors, they rarely attempt to propose any new radical visions for how society could be reorganised on the systemic level, no overarching systems of thought, and carefully seek to always reach the antithesis. As such, it appears as if postmodernity, now in its mature form, has moved to a point which equals its axial predecessor at the later stage following the initial revolutionary era of the axial age. The righteous postmodern rebels have made their mark in history. They shook up society with a brief, youthful outburst that provided them a foothold in the world by proudly defeating the last remnants of dated religious morality to which modern society should pay its gratitude.
Thereafter, they conquered the universities and the media and managed to change social discourse to a degree where most decent people had to pay lip service to their values. But now they have become part of the very same system they initially set out to overthrow. Nowhere is a new society to be seen on the postmodern horizon. Part of postmodernism's failure to foster a new society has, as mentioned, to do with its hostility towards all great narratives, its propensity to always reach the antithesis, and its inherent moral relativism. But, with no overarching symbol worlds shared by most of society, the meta-narratives rejected by Lyotard, and theorists never proposing new systems to replace the old, but always pursuing the antithesis, their stern reluctance towards new moral standards to stand above the always occurring relativism on the matter, it all leads us back into the claws of the market. If for no other reason, because money remains the only thing to unite us. Despite the intentions of most postmodern thinkers, the lack of a common moral and political compass has opened up the door for the market to take over. There are no longer any robust ideas or enduring ideologies that can keep the market at bay. Political endeavours have been watered down and various identity projects, criticisms of norms and special interest group issues are not sufficient to withstand the sprawl of the market. For lack of hope and vivid ideas in a greater context, everyone has to fend for themselves in trying to secure personal salvation through the offerings on the market. We lack a commonly shared symbol world to give us a mutual understanding of each other, generate a greater sense of communal belongingness and help us focus our collective efforts efficiently towards a new vision of a better society for all. Consequently, we are living in a society without an overarching value system where financial values are prioritised before cultural ones. Postmodernity's propensity towards moral relativism and emphasis on subjectivity has led to a condition where individual opinions, no matter how poorly grounded, are considered just as valid as carefully elaborated moral standards and expert knowledge. After all, in a world where everything is relative and all depends on the subjective perspective of the individual, who can say what's better or worse anyway? Or so it may seem. We have placed ourselves in a situation where more people are in contact with each other than ever before, but we still cannot talk to each other. The primary reason is that we have not fully realised that people cognitively function within different thought perspectives and thereby think and act very differently. This is something the postmodern thought perspective has failed to address. The world is, broadly speaking, divided into three main thought perspectives, the religious, the rational and the postmodern. But since there is no common symbol language that all the adherents of the different perspectives can speak, the only thing that connects us is money. Further on in the book we shall explore whether it is possible to go beyond this postmodern condition and together succeed in co-creating a shared symbol language to improve communication between different symbol worlds and thought perspectives. A new overarching symbol world in which differently thinking people can reach each other. How do we increase the understanding between various symbol worlds in our increasingly fragmented and complex reality? How do we manage the growing complexity of the world in a more productive and harmonious manner? And how do we succeed in getting religious, modern and postmodern people to cooperate and live together and live well? These and other questions will be at the centre of the following chapters of this book.